We now return to Baby Ellis's stories. Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Part 5. My Sea Adventure. Chapter 26. Israel Hands. The wind serving us to a desire now hauled into the west. We could run so much the easier from the northeast corner of the island to the mouth of the north inlet. Only as we had no power to anchor and dared not beach her till the tide had flowed a good deal further, time hung on our hands. The coxswain told me how to lay the ship to. After a good many trials I succeeded, and we both sat in silence over another meal. Captain, said he at length with that same uncomfortable smile. Here's my old shipmate, O'Brien. Suppose you was to heave him overboard. I ain't particular as a rule, and I don't take no blame for settling his hash. But I don't reckon him ornamental now, do you? I'm not strong enough, and I don't like the job. And there he lies for me, said I. This here is an unlucky ship. This Hispaniola, Jim, he went on blinking. There's a power of men been killed in this Hispaniola. A sight o' oh, poor seamen dead and gone since you and me took ship to Bristol. I never seen such dirty luck, not I. There was this here O'Brien now. He's dead, ain't he? Well, now I'm no scholar. And you're a lad as can read and figure. And to put it straight, do you take it as a dead man is dead for good? Or do he come alive again? You can kill the body, Mr. Hans, but not the spirit. You must know that already, I replied. O'Brien there is in another world and may be watching us. Ah, says he. Well, that's unfortunate appears as if killing parties was a waste of time. How some over? Spirits don't reckon for much by what I've seen. I'll chance it with the spirits, Jim. And now if you spoke up free, and I'll take it kind if you'd step down into that there cabin and get me a, well, a shiver me timbers. I can't hit the name on it. Well, you get me a bottle of wine, Jim. This here brandy's too strong for my head. Now the coxswain's hesitation seemed to be unnatural, and as for the notion of his preferring wine to brandy, and as for the notion of his preferring wine to brandy, I entirely disbelieved it. The whole story was a pretext. He wanted me to leave the deck. So much was plain, but with what purpose I could in no way imagine. His eyes never met mine. They kept wandering to and fro, up and down, now with a look to the sky, now with a, with a flitting glance upon the dead O'Brien. All the time he kept smiling and putting his tongue out in the most guilty, embarrassed manner so that a child could have told that he was bent on some deception. I was prompt with my answer, however, for I saw where my advantage lay, and that with a fellow so densely stupid I could easily conceal my suspicions to the end. Some wine, I said. Far better. Will you have white or red? Well, I reckon it's about the blessed same to me, shipmate, he replied. So it's strong and plenty of it. What's the odds? All right, I answered. I'll bring you port, Mr. Hans, but I'll have to dig for it. With that, I scuttled down the companion with all the noise I could, slipped off my shoes, ran quietly along the spared galley, mounted the forecastle ladder and popped my head out the fore companion. I knew he would not expect to see me there, yet I took every precaution possible, and certainly the worst of my suspicions proved too true. 
He had risen from his position to his hands and knees, and though his leg obviously hurt him pretty sharply when he moved, for I could hear him stifle a groan, yet it was at a good rattling rate that he trailed himself across the deck. In half a minute he had reached the port scuppers and picked out of coil, out of a coil of rope a long knife, or rather a short dirk, discoloured to the hilt with blood. He looked upon it for a moment, thrusting forth his under jaw, tried the point upon his hand, and then, hastily concealing it in the bosom of his jacket, trundled back again into his old place against the bulwark. This was all that I required to know. Israel could move about. He was now armed, and if he had been at so much trouble to get rid of me, it was plain that I was meant to be the victim. What he would do afterwards, whether he would try to crawl right across the island from North Inlet to the camp among the swamps, or whether he would fire Long Tom, trusting that his own comrades might come first to help him, was of course more than I could say. Yet I felt sure that I could trust him in one point, since in that our interests jumped together, and that was in the disposition of the schooner. We both desired to have her stranded safe enough, in a sheltered place, and so that when the time came, she could be got off again with as little labour and danger as might be. And until that was done, I considered that my life would certainly be spared. While I was thus turning the business over in my mind, I had not been idle with my body. I had stolen back to the cabin, slipped once more into my shoes, and laid my hand at random on a bottle of wine, and now with this for an excuse, I made my reappearance on the deck. Hands lay as I had left him, all fallen together in a bundle, and with his eyelids lowered as though he were too weak to bear the light, he looked up, however, at my coming, knocked the neck off the bottle like a man who had done the same thing often, and took a good swig with his favourite toast of here's luck. Then he lay quiet for a little, and then pulling out a stick of tobacco, begged me to cut him a quid. Cut me a junk of that, says he, for I haven't no knife and hardly strength enough, so be as I had. Ah, Jim, Jim, I reckon I've missed stays. Cut me a quid, as likely be the last lad, for I'm for, for I'm for my long home and no mistake. Well, said I, I'll cut you some tobacco. But if I was you and thought myself so badly, I would go to my prayers like a Christian man. Why, said he, now you tell me why. Why, I cried, you are asking me just now about the dead. You've broken your trust. You've lived in sin and lies and blood. There's a man you killed lying at your feet this moment. And you ask me why? For God's mercy, Mr. Hands, that's why. I spoke with a little heat, thinking of the bloody dirk he had hidden in his pocket and designed in his ill thoughts to end me with. For he, he, for his part, took a great draught of the wine and spoke with the most unusual solemnity. Solemnity. For thirty years, he said, I've sailed the seas and seen good and bad, better and worse fair weather and foul, provisions running out, knives going and what not. Well, now I tell you, I never seen good come o' goodness yet. Him as strikes first is my fancy. Dead men don't bite. Them's my views. Amen. So be it. And now you look here. He added suddenly, changing his tone. We've had an about enough of this foolery. The tide's made good enough by now. You just take my orders, Captain Hawkins, and we'll sail slap in and be done with it. 
All told, we had scarce two miles to run, but the navigation was delicate. The entrance to this northern anchorage was not only narrow and shoal, but lay east and west, so that the schooner must be nicely handled to be got in. I think I was a good prompt sub subaltern, and I am very sure that Hans was an excellent pilot, for we went about and about and dodged in, shaving the banks with a certainty and a neatness that were a pleasure to behold. Scarcely had we passed the heads before the land closed around us. The shores of North Inlet were as, thicky, were as thickly wooded as those of the northern anchorage, but the space was longer and narrower and more like what in truth it was, the estuary of a river. Right before us, at the southern end, we saw the wreck of a ship in the last stages of dilapidation. It had been a great vessel of three masts, but had lain so long exposed to the injuries of the weather that it was hung about with great webs of dripping seaweed, and on the deck of it, shore brushes had taken root and now flourished thick with flowers. It was a sad sight, but it showed us that the anchorage was calm. Now, said Hans, look here, there's a pet pit for to beach a ship in. Fine flat sand, never a cat's paw, trees all round of it, and flowers are blowing like a garden, like a garden on that old ship. And once beached, I inquired, how shall we get her off again? Why so, he replied, you take a line ashore there, on the other side at low water, take a turn about one of them big pines, bring it back, take a turn around the capstan, and lie to for the tide. Come high water, all hands take a pull upon the line, and off she comes as sweet as nature. And now, boy, you stand by. We're near a, the bit now, and she's too much way on her. Starboard a little, so steady. Starboard, starboard a little, steady, steady. So he issued his commands, which I breathlessly obeyed, till all of a sudden he cried, Now, my hearty, laugh! And I put the helm hard up, and the Hispaniola swung round rapidly and ran stem on for the low wooden shore. Stem on for the low wooded shore. The excitement of these last maneuvers had somewhat interfered with the watch I had kept hitherto, sharply enough upon the coxswain. Even then I was still so much interested, waiting for the ship to touch, that I had quite forgot the peril that hung over my head and stood craning over the starboard bulwarks and watching the ripples spreading wide before the bows. I might have fallen without a struggle for my life had not a sudden disquiet disquietude 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 I might have fallen without a struggle for my life had not a sudden disquietude seized upon me and made me turn my head. Perhaps I had heard a creak or seen his shadow moving with the tail of my eye. Perhaps it was an instinct like a cat's. But sure enough, when I looked around, there was Hans, already halfway towards me with the dirk in his right hand. We must both have cried out aloud when our eyes met, but while mine was the shrill cry of terror, his was a roar of fury like a charging bully's. At the same instant, he threw himself forward and I leapt sideways towards the bows. As I did so, I let go of the tiller, which sprang sharp to leeward, and I think this saved my life, for it struck hands across the chest and stopped him for the moment, dead. Before he could recover, I was safe out of the corner where he had trapped me, where he had me trapped, with all the deck to dodge about. Just forward of the main mast I stopped, drew a pistol from the pocket, 
took a cool aim, though he had already turned and was once more coming directly after me, and drew the trigger. The hammer fell, but there followed neither flash nor sound. The priming was useless with sea water. I cursed myself for my neglect. Why had not I, long before, reprimed and reloaded my only weapons, that I should have not been as now, a mere fleeing sheep before this butcher? Wounded as he was, it was wonderful how fast he could move, his grizzled hair trembling over his face, and his face itself as red as a red ensign with his haste and fury. I had no time to try my other pistol, nor indeed much inclination, for I was sure it would be useless. One thing I saw plainly, I must not simply retreat before him, or he would speedily hold me boxed into the bows, as a moment since he had so nearly boxed me in the stern. One so caught, and nine or ten inches of the blood-stained dirk would be my last experience on this side of eternity. I placed my palms against the main mass, which was of a goodish bigness, and waited every nerve upon the stretch. Seeing that I meant to dodge, he also paused, and a moment or two passed in feints on his part and corresponding movements upon mine. It was such a game as I had often played at home about the rocks of Black Hill Cove. But never before, you may be sure, with such a widely beating heart as now. Still, as I say, it was a boy's game, and I thought I could hold my own at it against an elderly seaman with a wounded thigh. Indeed, my courage had begun to rise so high that I allowed myself a few darting thoughts on what would be the end of the affair, and while I saw certainly that I could spin it out for long, I saw no hope of any ultimate escape. Well, while things stood thus, suddenly the Hispaniola struck, staggered, ground for an instant in the sand, and then swift as a blow, canted over to the port side till the deck stood at an angle of 45 degrees and about a puncheon of water splashed into the scupper holes and lay in a pool between the deck and the bulwark. We were both, we were both of us capsized in a second, and both of us rolled almost together into the scuppers, the dead red cap, with his arms still spread out, tumbling swiftly after us. So near were we indeed that my head came against the coxswain's foot with a crack that made my teeth rattle. Blow and all, I was the first afoot again, for hands had got involved with the dead body. The sudden canting of the ship had made the deck no place for running. I had to find some new way of escape, and that upon the instant, for my foe was almost touching me. Quick as thought, I sprang into the mizzen shrouds, rattled up hand over hand, and did not draw a breath till I was seated on the cross trees. I had been saved by being prompt. The dirk had struck not half a foot below me as I pursued my upward flight. And there stood Israel Hands, with his mouth open and his face upturned to mine, a perfect statue of surprise and disappointment. Now that I had my moment to myself, I lost no time in changing the priming of my pistol. And then having one ready for service, and to make assurance doubly sure, I proceeded to draw the load of the other and recharge it afresh from the beginning. My new employment struck hands all of a heap. He began to see the dice going against him, and after an obvious hesitation, he also hauled himself heavily into the shrouds, and with the dirk in his teeth, he began slowly and painfully to mourn. It cost him no end of time and groans to haul his wounded leg behind him. And I had quietly finished my arrangements, for he was much more than a third of the way up. Then, with a pistol in either hand, I addressed him. One more step, Mr. Hands, said I, and I'll blow your brains out. 
dead men don't bite, you know, I added with a chuckle. He stopped instantly. I could see by the working of his face that he was trying to think, and the process was slow and laborious that, in my new found security, I laughed aloud. At last, with a swallow or two, he spoke, his face still wearing the same expression of extreme perplexity. In order to speak, he had to take the dagger from his mouth, but in all else, he remained unmoved. Jim, says he, I reckon we're fouled, you and me, and we'll have to sign articles. I'd have had you, but for that there's lurch. But I don't have no luck, not I. And I reckon I'll have to strike, which comes hard, you see, for a master mariner to a ship's yonker like you, Jim. I was drinking in his words and smiling away, as conceited as a cock upon a wall, when all in a breath, Back went his right hand over his shoulder. Something sang like an arrow through the air. I felt a blow and then a sharp pang. And there I was, pinned by the shoulders to the mast. In the horrid pain and surprise of the moment, I scarce can say it was by my own volition. I am sure it was without a conscious aim. Both my pistols went off and both escaped out of my hands. They did not fall alone. With a choked cry, the coxswain loosened his grasp upon the shrouds and plunged headfirst into the water.